Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back after I think it was a great uh, session this morning, and hopefully we'll have a, another great session this afternoon. Our guest this afternoon, opening guest, is somebody I think one can honestly say he doesn't need any introduction. So I'm not going to do any introduction other than to welcome John. Uh, we're delighted that uh, you're able to join us this afternoon and brought. And if you haven't yet got your copy of this, I do strongly recommend. It's a, it's a very good read. Uh, but John, here you are. You've um, you stood down from the Today program after all those years, and you're doing Mastermind. Why? Money? No, no, no. <laughs> um, it, it's a good question, and the, and the honest answer is that when I got an email. 17, 16, 17 years ago, saying, uh, would you do Mastermind? I immediately replied, saying no. A few days went by, and I got another one saying, you sure you don't want to do Mastermind? I immediately replied, saying no. Then I got a call from the head of Light Entertainment, no less, at the BBC, saying, why won't you present Mastermind? And I said, oh, present Mastermind. <laughs> And I thought, oh, yes, I'd have all the answers. Anyway, obviously, I said yes. And, and I tell you, it, it, is, it is the best thing I've ever done. It, in this sense, in this sense, I've spent most of my uh, professional, if you can call it that, life um, asking politicians questions. And I tell you, doing Mastermind and asking people questions knowing that they want to answer them <laughs> a, in fact, you, you do, of course, get some very, and if we've got just a second for a wee bit of... Answer them with the truth. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not going to get drawn into that yet, yet, but I'm, I'm just going to test you or to make sure you're awake after lunch. Because uh, we, we have some bizarre answers, as you may, if, if, you, if you watch, particularly if you, you watch the occasional um, celebrity mastermind over Christmas and the New Year, when we have people there who are not necessarily there for their... Um, mastermind so much as their celebrity. But anyway, and you do get some slightly bizarre answers. So I'm going to test you. May I do that? Right. Soap opera star, I ask, what breakfast cereal do you associate with prison? <laughs> porridge, yes, porridge, yes. What did he say? Cheerios. <laughs> Um, I, was, I was never quite sure whether he, was, whether he was making some profound observation on the government's penal policy or whether he was just bloody thick, I think the latter. Um, two, three more then, very quick ones. Uh, I've asked these of, I asked these of a politician, I shall tell you who in just a moment, they're more difficult than the last one admittedly. Who succeeded Henry VIII? Edward VI, Edward VI. well done, well done, yes, not as he said, Henry VII. <laughs> what, what, what was the name of the prison that they stormed in Paris in 1789? Mm -hmm, not Versailles. <laughs> and what was what was what, Christ, what was the uh, what was the surname of the lady called Marie who discovered radiation? <laughs> and not Antoinette. <laughs> and all of this true, and his name was David Lamy. And he was, at the time, Her Majesty's Minister of State for Higher Education. <laughs> I rest my case. Go on, sorry. That, 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 that's the answer to your did, question. Did he apologise after? Did he apologise after? I think he probably didn't realise what he'd done. <laughs> Which is a kind way of saying, no, of course he didn't. <laughs> well, that's a great way to start, but uh, we, we've sort of jumped to the end. We've jumped to a few weeks ago, but I'd like to go back more to the beginning. Because... Mm. If you look at people in, in BBC News, they tend to have a certain background. Certainly uh, some of the more senior people, one associates Oxbridge, perhaps even private school, etc., etc. That wasn't it's like me, really. That wasn't, well, I was about to say, John, that wasn't exactly your background. Was Not it? quite, no, no. I uh, came from a poor family. We lived in uh, a pretty rough part of, uh, of Cardiff called Splot. It really was the name of the place, not the where something had, you know, splot, it wasn't, it was, it was the name of it. And, um, and I left school at the age of 15, and um, uh, that was it, really. That was the end of my education, such as it was, and I went to a local newspaper and got a job. I, I left school on the Friday, got a job on the local newspaper called the Penarth Times uh, on the uh, following Monday, and, um, and so on. So, yes, that, that's the extent of my education. And the path from I'm there... I'm afraid to say. <laughs> 
the lengthy path from there to the BBC? Was... And, well, not all that lengthy. I went from the Penarth Times to a slightly bigger weekly newspaper in the Merthyr Tidville, and from there a slightly uh, bigger newspaper, daily newspaper, the Western Mail, and then I got offered a job uh, by the Sunday Times um, as a, uh, the first, one of the first members of the, the Insight team, and you'll know that Insight has been a huge, we're talking about a very long time ago, I was, I was not at a lad, I was 21, and, uh, and I went up to London, I'd only been to London once before, and they took me to lunch in somewhere called Simpsons in the Strand. I'd never in my life been. I didn't know such posh restaurants existed. And I was completely intimidated by these two um, posh senior people, edit, deputy editor and news editor. And, and I said, yes, oh, yes, please, yes, yes, please, sir. I'd love to come to the Sunday Times. And then got back to, uh, to Cardiff and went for a beer. Uh, with some of the old lags from the local newspapers. And, and one of them said, and I was terribly proud, you know, boasting about how I'd um, been offered a job on the Sunday Times. And, and he said, ah, newspaper, well, you stay with the newspaper. Television's where it's at. Why don't you come to TWW, the local television station? And uh, I bet I can uh, swing it for you. So I did. I went and they gave me a job and that was it. I was in broadcasting and then I stayed there for, yeah. And then a couple of years later, the BBC offer me a job and here I am, or here I was. Well, still am, I suppose, but um, yeah, there, there I was, as it were. And in those uh, early years, uh, still in Wales, you would, I think reading the book, which is, I have done, there's quite a seminal moment and uh, you had to re report on Abba Fan. It, 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 for me, it was, it was m more than, well, it was life-changing. Um, you, 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 of course, most of you anyway, um, will remember uh, what happened on that day, uh, the disaster. In fact, if I may, I'll just read you um, a, a little bit about it from, from my book, because I was the, uh, the first reporter on the scene uh, at Aberfan, and um, I knew the area well. I'd been, as I said, I was working for TWW at the time, and I was in the, um, in the newsroom on that morning, and I saw... Uh, at about 9.30, I saw a, um, a breaking news story, only a very small story, on the ticker tape machine, remember them before computers? Um, and uh, that there had been a cold slide, a, a, a tip slide, in, in uh, the Merthyr Valley at, at, at Aberfan. And I thought, you know, it might be worth going up to have a look, because I knew the area well. Um, and normally, the tip slides didn't amount to very much uh, sometimes a few people injured, usually just a bit of destruction. Uh, but in this case, I knew what the possible possible significance of it might have been, and I thought it was worth go going to have a look. Uh, but of course, I had no idea you know, the, the extent of it. And, and let me just read you, if I may, uh, uh, for a minute or two, what I wrote uh, just, just after it had happened. Just after 9.15, a group of workmen had been sent to the top of the big tip that loomed above Aberfan, grey, black and ugly. There had been some worrying signs that it was sinking more than usual. A deep depression had formed within the tip like the crater in a volcano. As the men watched, the waste rose into the depression, formed itself into a lethal tidal wave of slurry and rolled down the hillside, gathering speed and height until it was 30 feet high and destroying everything in its path. From that moment, the name of Aberfan has been synonymous with tragedy beyond comprehension. It crushed part of the school and some tiny houses alongside, like a ton of concrete dropping on a matchbox. And what that foul mixture of black waste did not flatten, it filled. Classrooms choked with the stuff until the building was covered and the school became a tomb. The moment the terrible news reached them, hundreds of miners had abandoned the coal face at the colliery which had created that monstrous tip and raced to the surface and there they were when I arrived, their faces still black save for the streaks of white from the sweat and the tears as they dug and wept and prayed. Most of them were digging for their own children. Every so often somebody would scream for silence and we would all stand frozen. Was that the cry of a child we had heard coming from deep below us? Sometimes it was and some were saved. I saw a burly policeman carrying a little girl in his arms, her legs dangling down, her shoes missing. She was a skinny little thing, no more than nine years old. Thank God she was alive. 
The men dug all day and all night and all the next day. They dug until there were no more faint cries, no more hope. But still they kept going. They were digging now for bodies. I watched through the hours and days that followed as the tiny coffins mounted up in the little chapel. There is nothing so poignant as the sight of a child's coffin. By the end of it, there were 116 of them, 116 dead children and 28 adults. And the reason that I say, you hinted at it, Colin, that that was for me a seminal moment. I mean, obviously, a youngster like I was at the time, anybody, any human being, is, is going to be mightily, profoundly affected by seeing something as awful as that. But it was a bit more than that for me, because what I knew, having worked in that area for three years, I went there when I was 17 years old, um, was that the men, the miners, knew that that tip should not have been built in that place, because it was directly above the village, and there was, on a slope, of course, a steep slope, and there was a spring, a serious spring, inside that hill, the hillside. And they knew that under the right conditions, or the worst conditions, that tip was unstable. And they told the National Coal Board that that tip was unstable, and they were ignored, totally ignored, totally ignored. And after it had happened, the NCB, led by its thug, Lord Robins, denied it, lied through his teeth until the inquiry eventually found the truth. And they had the truth because the men had kept copies of the letters they had written to the coal board who had denied every word of it. And those 116 children died because of those men in authority. And what, forgive me, I get, get a bit um, agitated at the thought. What, what it told me as a, a youngster was that if you're going to be a journalist, You've got to be deeply, deeply suspicious of authority. Wherever it is, whatever form it takes, don't trust. Do not trust. Trust has to be earned. And the, the fact that Robins and his cronies didn't spend the rest of their lives in jail is an eternal shame. But there we are. Anyway, that's the effect that Abavan had on me. Yeah. That, that explains a lot, John, and uh, also why later on that, as you say, deep distrust of authority, which did show through, but occasionally it sort of came through as a, gave you the reputation of being a bit stroppy, a bit, uh, a bit bullshit in that sense, do you think? Uh, grump, with gr pump. Grump, grumpy as well. You know? Well, That's even grumpy, possibly, possibly, very unlikely, very unlikely. Um, but only with politicians, Colin, I think you'd have, uh, with real people, I like to think I was... A little ray of sunshine. Um, um, but, but yes, I, I, uh, look, people, you may, may be amongst them, you, you in, in, in this audience, um, people uh, accuse me of um, doing something wrong because of my interruptions. Um, and the fact is, uh, certainly in the early days, I would, I would admit to this in my early days on the Today program, um, I did interrupt too much. I was too stroppy, and I thought that I had... 20, 29 times with uh, ah, the then Chancellor, wasn't well, it? No, uh, I, well, no, well, that, that, that is, that is you, you raise an interesting point, yes. I, I was, on one occasion, um, let me go back just a few hours, be, be, before, a few days before that happened. I, I got a call from the boss one Friday evening to tell me that a certain politician was going to be making a speech that evening, that Friday evening, um, demanding my, basically demanding my head on a stick because um, I had um, shown myself to be guilty of poisoning the well, that's the expression he used, poisoning the well of democratic debate. And as evidence, I put the word evidence in quotation marks, he uh, cited an example of an interview that I had done with Ken Clark. Yep, and not trying to... 34 times I had interrupted him. He alleged 34 times in the space of an eight-minute interview. It wasn't true. It was 37 times. But anyway, I, I, uh, and, 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 and so said this politician, cabinet minister, a cabinet minister, member of the uh, 
Margaret Thatcher's government, uh, cabinet, uh, and he said that um, something should be done about me, and that um, his, he and his colleagues... Not Ken uh, Clark. Uh, didn't say this, was not, it? Not Ken Clark. No, no. This was the politician who made the speech, speech accusing me of exactly. poisoning the well of democratic yeah. debate. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I'll come to Ken in just one sec, yeah. because what he said, this individual, I'll tell you his name in one second, what he said, the individual said, was that um, he and his colleagues, other cabinet ministers, should basically boycott the programme if I were on it. So, in other words, it would have, well, I'd have had to resign, clearly, if he'd had the support of his... Um, of his fellow cabinet ministers, which he did not, because he made that speech on the Friday night over the next couple of days, that weekend. It was a very big story. Um, you know, is this the end of Humphreys on the day? And all that kind of stuff. And then on the Monday morning, a chap called Douglas Hurd, some of you uh, will remember him, former foreign secretary, rang in or got his person to ring in from, the day, from his office. He was due to be interviewed on the program. He said, just wanted to let you know that I'll be coming on the program. Um, and um, perfectly happy. If, Mr. Humphreys is going to be interviewing me, no problem with that at all. And then, on the World at One, Ken Clark himself appeared, and the presenter asked him about this attack on me, and how many times I'd interrupted him and all that, and Ken said, and I quote Ken, what a load of nonsense. <laughs> Good old Ken. And the name of the politician who launched that savage, vicious attack upon me was Jonathan Aitken. And very soon after that, he was spending time at Her Majesty's pleasure because he had been convicted in the courts of the land of perjury. <laughs> there is a God. <laughs> that has to be an issue of some concern to any politician you interview in any new job in the future. Do well, <laughs> but once again, we've jumped ahead a bit. So, Ooh. local television in, in, in Wales, then entry into the BBC. How did, how did that happen? Um, they wanted somebody to, uh, they wanted to have a reporter in Liverpool, in the northwest, television news, remember, yeah. because there were loads and loads of radio reporters all over the place, very few television news reporters. So I, um, I, I was sent to, uh, to Liverpool to open a little, and by little I mean just me, television news bureau for the northwest of England, um, which, which, which I did, and uh, spent uh, a great couple of years there and um, then became the Northern Industrial Correspondent for the BBC and then got a call to come down to London, which I did. So uh, I, I then came down to London as television news reporter. And it was at the time when they were, the BBC, were recognising, whether this was a mistake or not, I'm, I'm still to, to this moment not certain, we decided, it was decided in the BBC, that um, television, for the purpose of news, television and radio should be separate and distinct. I'm not sure there is any logic in that, to be honest with you, unless you think that there is a profound difference between if you're a journalist like me, a reporter like me, if you're reporting on a particular story, are you going to be doing it differently if you're radio or television? The answer is no, you're not, because you're going to be looking for the same things. But, of course, there are technical things. I mean, like you have to have pictures for television news, and that requires maybe a certain set of skills that you don't have to have in radio. On the other hand, radio reporters are required to have the ability to, to script the story well, to tell the story without pictures, and so on and so on. Anyway, they decided they needed to have foreign correspondents, television-based foreign correspondents, because there weren't any, um, and they decided that they would place four of them in different... Uh, parts of the world, I was the, the man chosen to go to the United States uh, to set up a bureau in, in the United States, and my patch, such as it was, uh, was, um, well, the whole of America, really, North and South America. I wasn't home very much. Uh, it, was, um, it, was a, it was a pretty, pretty full-on job, really. And I had, I've always said that, um, I'm often asked by youngsters who want to become journalists, uh, and they often ask what skills you need, and, and I always answer. Oh, they usually say to be in the profession, and I always say it isn't, a, journalism isn't a profession. You know, if you're a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher or whatever, you need qualifications. You don't need qualifications to be a journalist. You need two things, it's always seemed to me. Uh, the first, and overwhelmingly the most important, is curiosity. You need to want to know how things work, why they work, why this happens, and so on and so on and so on. You need to be curious. I can't stand 
those of very few of, of my colleagues who think they know it all. And they, you know, there are three, but as a reporter, there are a few simple questions that, that, that you, you need to be answered, and that is who, what, where, when, why. That's it, it's as simple as that. Who, what, where, when, why. And if you can answer all of those questions in the course of an interview, then fine. Uh, the other thing you need, apart from curiosity, is luck. And I had tons and tons of luck. I just happened to be, no ability of my own, uh, I happened to find myself over the years in the right place at the right time. For instance, when I, I set up, was sent to the United States, and I was a young man at 27 at the time, and within, I'd never been to America, and within a few days, literally, of arriving in America, a certain president called Richard Nixon, you may remember the name, um, uh, became involved in a little incident called Watergate. And I happened to be there and instead of staying as I was meant to be originally, I was sent over there for three months to set up this bureau. I stayed there in the end for the best part of six years, and I happened to be covering, you know, that was, Watergate became my story. I mean, wow, what a story. Then I went down to South Africa, and I saw the collapse, basic collapse of apartheid, and so on and so on. I just had an endless run of, of being in the right place at the right time. Then you must have got fed up being abroad, so you decided to... Yeah, I, I change, change of role. I, 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 I did. Fed up is maybe yes. I did get. I, I got fed up with living out of a suitcase, basically, and hotels. Because my last year on the road, I was away from home for the best part of nine months, and you don't see your children growing up. I, mean, I, I remember on, I took in the, in those days, one, one went on very very long if, if one was sent off to cover an important story in an important part of the world and other stuff was going on. You might very well spend a long time there. I spent three periods of, of at least three months away from home uh, consecutively. And uh, I had a little, uh, one of my kids at the time was, was a baby. Um, when I went off on one of those trips, when I came back, she was a toddler. So you missed, I missed seeing her learn to walk. And I mean, that matters in the end. And, and as they get a bit older, well, you know some of them, um, you, you want to be there. Um, and, and I wasn't there, I was never there. So I decided that um, I wanted to be here uh, to do something else. And they offered me the chance to read the news on telly. And I said yes. And um, yeah. Bit, bit boring reading a script? Not a bit boring, bloody boring. <laughs> Um, I mean, with the best will of the world, if Hugh is listening, um, it, it, it is not the most challenging job that <laughs> broadcasting has to offer, or indeed, I mean, you, you, you've got to read, you know, you've got to be able to read, you know, that's it really, and I mean, you've got to be able to look into a camera while you're reading and not fall off the chair or something, and, you know, all of that, but yeah, boring, I did it for the best part of six years. And by golly, was I glad when I went home one night, and it was about midnight because I'd been doing the late news as well. Um, and, uh, and the phone rang, and it was the Today program, the end of the Today program on the line, saying John Timpson's about to retire, or in a few months, defends his job. And I didn't even hesitate, not, not for a millisecond. I didn't even say how much money, you know. I just said yes. And that was it. And the rest is history. And the rest, history. although not quite. And yet. the rest, it's uh, yeah. The rest is history, <laughs> Colin. Yes, yes. <coughs> I'm left. <coughs> yes. <laughs> so joining the Today program as an established team, um, what was it like trying to fit in with that team? And uh, how uh, how was it different from what you've been doing before? I mean, there are the obvious ways that it's different, but what was what was culturally different? How well, two, 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 a few things. I mean, one, one, it not a team in a sense. Uh, it's a curious thing about being. What is it curious about being a presenter of a program? Because although obviously you rely, I was going to say, a lot. You rely totally on the hugely underpaid team of researchers and producers who put the program together because they they're, they're the people who do the real work. You know, they, they make the program what it is. We come in, the presenters come in at the end of it all when all the work's been done and we get to sit there and ask questions and, you know, that, that's, that's the easy bit. Um, but the, but the, if, if there is a difficult bit to it, um, is, and, and it is a different challenge, as you rightly say, from what I had been doing as a reporter, is that it's live. That, that's the point. You're on the air live for three hours and um, you're... you're for a certain amount, some of it, of course, is, is, is pre-planned, clearly. I mean, there are lots of packages, as we call them, reporter packages and things. So that, But when you're doing a live interview, you're doing a live interview, and if you get something wrong or do something stupid, the whole world 
is able to see it happening. And that's the difference between doing that and being a reporter on the road, as it were, where you've got time to think about the report you're going to produce and all that kind of thing. Um, so a, a completely different environment in, in pretty much, plus, of course, intensely political. I'd never interviewed uh, politicians, really, before I started on the Today programme. Um, I mean, I, I do film interviews with them, of course, out on the road. I remember doing uh, with Margaret Thatcher, the first time I interviewed Margaret Thatcher. I was in Washington at the time, and she was um, education secretary, as I recalled. Yeah, do you remember that? Thatcher, Thatcher, milk snatcher, remember that? <laughs> and I remember interviewing her on the lawn of the White House. And uh, all I remember about it, quite literally, is that she was standing just underneath a tree. One of the branches, at least, was stretching out. Of, and we started to film the interview, and as we did, a squirrel came along the branch, and it <laughs> ran all the way down and stopped about six inches away from it. She was unconscious of it, of course, because she, she was looking at me, and I, I could see it because I was, and I was just dying for the squirrel to just, well, you can imagine, can't you? <laughs> Never did, unfortunately. I wonder how she'd have reacted. She'd have probably, go away. <laughs> um, yeah. So getting on to some of the, the, uh, the, the uh, nitty-gritty stuff as well about the Day the Day programme and the BBC more generally. I mean, the, in the book, there's quite a lot of criticism of the BBC. Uh, there's a lot of love for the BBC as well, and uh, you obviously strongly believe in it. I do. But if I can grossly oversimplify the criticism. I'm a journalist. <laughs> Listen, there is one rule, Colin, for journalism, OK? One basic rule. Bear this in mind, ladies and gentlemen. One basic rule of journalism. First simplify, then exaggerate. Well, I'll, so. I'll begin by simplifying, which is that you feel that the kind of institutional liberalism of the BBC, the, the kind of culture there, meant that it's been slow to recognise some of the, the big changes that have gone on initially at Thatcherism, more recently changes in terms of approach to immigration, some of the issues that led to the um, exit, exit vote in Brexit. Um, could you say a bit more about that? Because you're... you're Pretty, pretty strong in that. In the book. There is, and I have felt this for many years, and I don't think I'm, well, I know I'm not alone in feeling this, and some of you in the audience may uh, share the sentiment, or perhaps not, may hear in a moment. Um, but there is a broadly liberal left, left liberal bias, um, has been, I think, for most of the time that I've been there. Um, and, and yes, you put your finger on a couple of them. Um, we were very, very slow um, in the 19, late 80s, early 90s to recognize the mood of the nation. This is the point, really. It's being, it's being in touch with the mood of the nation. Um, and I'll come back to that in just a second. But we did not recognize, we, I mean, the corporate body, as it were, um, the unease, sometimes often downright hostility to the level of immigration. Um, we, I'm going to say they, because I didn't share this view, but felt that if you were in any way critical of any aspect of immigration, you are some sort of, you know, you frightful sort of, you know, gosh, wretched, you know. Um, and the same applied to um, the, the, the EU. Uh, if you were skeptical about the EU, then um, you were beyond the pale, really. Because, I mean, we all believe, don't we? The whole nation, surely, all civilized people believe that being a member of the European Union is the right thing to do for and you all voted, sorts you of reasons. I, I personally voted Remain. I mean, I wouldn't have said that while I was on the programme, of course, sure. while I was yeah. on the programme. But yes, I did vote Remain. Um, but I'd like to think that, that um, I recognised, and some of my colleagues did as well, but the corporate view is, was, maybe still is, that um, our destiny was irredeemably and should be irredeemably allied with that of the European Union. Now, I personally kind of think that's a bit of a, but we, let's not go into that. That's, that's, that's beside the point what I think about that particular issue. But the fact is, the BBC found it very difficult to take seriously, this is the point I'm making, to take seriously the views of those um, Eurosceptics 
who believed there was there were many things profoundly wrong with the, BBC, with, with, with the European Union, and there might very well be an argument for leaving We refused to take them seriously, to be blunt about it, for a very long time. Now, I also think that when it came time, for when, when the referendum was held, I believe during the referendum, BBC News was absolutely fair-minded. We were right down the middle, and not, neither side has any criticism of how we behave during that. However, it was immediately obvious to me and to many other people that as soon as the referendum had, had, had uh, the, the last votes had been cast and, 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 and Brexit, uh, the Brexit argument had won, the BBC was shocked. Now, this is not because there is any... The BBC is not a monolithic organisation, let me put it like that. There is no, if you'd asked the chairman of the BBC who was sitting there a moment ago um, what he felt the BBC should, about a particular view, he would have said, perhaps you did, I missed him, unfortunately, but, but, but he would have said, I have no doubt, we, the BBC, does not have a view on any political issue of the day, because that's not our job. At least I hope that's what he said. That's not our job. It is not the BBC's job to have a view on political issues. It's a, the BBC's job to have a view on certain things. I mean, Lord Reith, the great Lord Reith, um, was, 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 was perfectly clear. I mean, we, we know what Lord Reith believed that the BBC should stand for. You know, the three values that it should inform, educate, and entertain. Absolutely right. We also knew his view that the BBC should be impartial. Due impartiality is the word that's always used. Except in Reith's own words, when it comes to the argument as between good and evil. Now, who could argue with that? Absolutely, profoundly, profoundly right on every single level. Um, but over the years, what's happened is the BBC has been staffed by people and this isn't in itself a criticism to be said. I'm not quite sure how else they could have handled it, but by people who are broadly, broadly, the product of the better universities. They come from nice middle-class families. Um, they've been taught by nice middle-class academics and professors, broadly of the left. This isn't me making assumptions here. This is some, some fairly robust research that's been done. 80% of, uh, of, of lecturers in universities are of the left rather than of the right. So it's inevitable that when they join the BBC, they will hold these broadly liberal left views. Now, it doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. What matters is that it exists. And that, I think, is what worries me. Thank you. I think that's a good moment to throw it open for questions. So. Uh, raise your hand and say who you are before you uh, ask a question. Uh, Vincent Porter, I see there, I think. Yeah, just gentleman here. Just in oh, the middle. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and then, oh, wait, wait, then at the back. I'm going yeah. there first. Vincent Porter, could you, do, could you take us through your day from when you get up to when you start presenting the programme, how you spend the time, and also in relation to your last comment, did you recognise any difference between the views in the newspapers and the views you were getting from your researchers who were presenting you with briefs when you arrived at the BBC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but my day was very, very simple. Well, simple. <laughs> um, I would set my alarm clock for about half past three. Well, not about half. And not my alarm clock, clocks, plural, three of them, just in case, just in case. Uh, three alarm clocks, seven half of three. I would get up, um, I would have showered the day before, and uh, the, the night before, or bath, whatever, showered. And um, I'd have been in the car and boom, 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 and in the office by four o'clock. And then that's when I would start um, congratulating the overnight editor on what a wonderful running order they'd managed to produce overnight. In other words, being roughly translated, we'd have a hell of a row about why this wasn't in and why that wasn't in and whatever. Um, so that's, that's when, that's the first thing you would do. You'd look at the running order and you'd say, what, what, are you really going to do that into it? You know, all that sort of, well, because you'd be in a bad mood. Uh, bearing in mind, this poor chap or woman had been up all night doing it. We, we honestly, presenters treat their 
overnight editors, disgracefully, I can say that now that I've left, because I was one of them, and mostly we get very impatient and intolerant, um, and they've done a hell of a job, you know, they're up all night, they haven't had any sleep like us, we got up early, but then they sleep at all. And then one would, I'd, you'd scan the newspapers in the car, I would anyway, uh, being driven into the, 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 uh, the office, um, and in my own particular case, I would um, then write a few what we call cues, you know, the introductions to things that you're about to say. Sometimes you do a bit of that, sometimes you wouldn't, sometimes you, well, in my particular case, I just find ways of wasting time. I mean, you should be sitting there using that hour or two before the program goes on the air. You should be using it to concentrate fiercely on whatever interviews you were doing and all that. And in my case, I, I would find any excuse in the world not to do that. So, so you'd end up doing an interview with somebody thinking, now what the hell am I, you know. Yeah, ridiculous, I can't explain it. I did it like that for, and every single, pretty much every single morning, I said, why do you do this, please? Why don't you do, and I don't know. But anyway, for 33 years, that's, that's how I function. So you get on the air. <laughs> sort of vague idea of what you were going to do, but not problem. And then when, when you're about a minute away or four minutes away from the interview, then you really start concentrating and think, oh my God, what am I going to do? So the result was I would never have any questions written down for me or anything else. I wouldn't do that. Some of my fellow presenters would assiduously, very sensibly, write out some questions and they'd turn out. I could never do that. Never, never got into the habit of it and just, you know, and always assumed, hoped that... I think of something to ask at the last minute. Um, so that's how it was. So you'd go into, and, and then you'd be in the studio with one minute to go before we were on air. And then for the rest of the time, you know, like the, the proverbial duck, you know, sailing across the water smoothly and underneath paddling like buggery to keep up, you know. Um, and that, that, that would be the. Now, as, as for your question ab about newspapers, um, it, it, it is an interesting question. I mean, obviously, um, the difference between a newspaper and us in the BBC, news people in the BBC, is that newspapers um, have views, required to have views. Their readers want them to have views. It's absolutely right that they have views. And personally, I don't care what those views are. I mean, clearly we've got laws about racism and so on, and that's not allowed. But I don't give a damn what, what, and I think also, and I do feel strongly about this, that we should read, we journalists who work for the BBC, as I did, um, should read every newspaper. I used to get a lot of stick because uh, I read the Daily Mail, which I did every morning, um, along with The Guardian and The Times and The Telegraph and so on. And people, we, we, we once had a director general who was so cross because the Daily Mail had been critical about the BBC for whatever it was and various other things about the Mail, that, that, that he instructed, that uh, instructed is maybe too strong a word, he, he, uh, he made it clear that he thought we, the journalists, should not read the Daily Mail. Um, I thought that was outrageous and I did say so. Um, uh, I, 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 think, took... I think you say who that is in the book, don't you? What? I think you say which director general that was. Oh, Greg Dyke. <laughs> but don't tell anybody I said so. <laughs> um, and and I, I, I take the exact opposite view. Any, any, any journalist on BBC who does not read the Daily Mail should be sacked because it represents, you know, many, many millions of people. And, and, and to pretend that its views don't exist. And, and, and it's changed a great deal over the last few years since Paul Dacre left, as we all know, or well, some of us know. Um, but uh, no, our job's to read all the newspapers. Uh, not, not in order to, to take a lead from them, as it were, although obviously they will know things that, that we don't know by definition, because there are you know, a lot of people out there and a lot of very, very good reporters on some very good newspapers. I think we're blessed in this country, frankly, with the standard of newspapers we got. And if you don't like one newspaper, if you don't like the Mail, you can read The Guardian. If you don't like The Guardian, you can read The Times or whatever. Um, and I think we're very lucky in this country to have the newspapers we've got with the freedom that they enjoy. Absolute cornerstone of democracy, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but we, the BBC, do not have political views. We should not have political views. Apart from the obvious ones, we believe in democracy and so on. But, but we do not have political views at all. So we should know what the papers are saying. Uh, we should allow it to um, form the background 
to questions, perhaps, but we should not allow it, them to dictate our views. And, and, and I do worry, going back to what I was saying a moment ago, that, that um, uh, all, I think it's fair to say, pretty much every single journalist in the BBC does read The Guardian. Uh, quite a few don't read the mail or the telegraph. And um, hmm. yeah. Question at the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Preston. Um, it was Carlton Green was the Director General and he hated Mary Whitehouse, and the rest you can work out for yourself. Abba Fan gets worse. The coal board moved down there. The locals had collected three quarters of a million disaster oh, fund. Yes, yes. And the coal board took, I think it was quarter of a million, yep. the inquiry. Coming back to your point about... You're quite right, by the way, yes. I, I, yes it, 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 the whole thing is just... Yeah, disaster, yeah. horrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the point about radio versus television, I was down in Torquay at the Palace Hotel organising a group conference and we noticed men in suits poised about the building. And as we were leaving, armed police arrived and arrested a lot of people who were smuggling into the hotel because there was a gully under the hotel which was how the money came to the, build the palace. But it was reported on the radio, but nothing on television because they couldn't get the cameras there. <laughs> I don't know whether that affects your <laughs> views on reporting. I, uh, I, I have no personal knowledge of that. Uh, but it is the case. Well, I think um, in many respects, uh, in some respects, Radio news is better than... T I get most of my, almost all of my um, broadcast news from BBC Radio, almost all of it Radio 4. Um, I haven't watched television news as a habit for more years than I can remember. I watch it occasionally, obviously, and clearly when something like 9-11 happens, you, you want, you need to see the pictures. That's obviously the case. Um, mostly, I would prefer radio news. Um, I dislike so much about modern television news. I dislike intensely the way reporters um, are ordered that, uh, that they must use their hands when they are talking to you. You know, they, they, they can't just stand there and talk to the camera. They have to say, and behind me, the White House. Yes, I can see the White House for myself. And, 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 and if they're being desperately sincere, they will do that with their hands. And, and they, they've been ordered. Where they actually, this may be, a, I don't think it's apocryphal. It's possible it is. But I do believe that the BBC at one point, about 20 years ago, whenever, when American news was exerting a huge influence, still is, on, on the world we they did actually bring in experts to instruct television news reporters as to how they should deport themselves in front of the camera and how they should use their hands for emphasis. No, 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 no. I hate it. I hate it. When I read the television news, we sat, on, <laughs> we sat in front of a, a cardboard background with a thing that said nine o'clock news, and that was about it, technically. There were problems with that, because we didn't, we didn't have any of the computerized stuff, obviously. So when we, we, uh, if you wanted to, to put up a caption, Harold Wilson, for instance, um, you just had to hope that they had all the letters, H-A-R-O-L-D. And if you didn't, you might end up with Harold Ilson, because they never have a W left. You know, that sort of ridiculous nonsense happened. So technology has been a, 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 a change for the, for the better. I wouldn't deny that. But by golly, some of it is profoundly irritating. And frankly, I can manage without it. Having watched Strictly on uh, Saturday Night, John, this stuff... Sorry, what, watch what? Strictly? No, it, it, it's no. It's popular programme. No, I don't, don't believe I have. I happen to, I've I, been invited to I appear have, on it, I'll have, have you know. <laughs> I'll tell I you what I said say, to them as well. The stuff at the arm is called armography. No, <laughs> oh, oh, really? I'll take your word for it, Colin. Yeah. Sorry, question towards the back here. Um, Edward Milner, ex-BBC producer. Um, uh, John, I'm sorry, I do have to pick you up about what you said about the... EU and about the referendum. I was very, very unhappy personally. I didn't think the BBC gave an unbiased view for the referendum because the history of our relationship with the EU was completely missing, so people didn't know that. And you say that a lot of people had turned against the EU. There were 30%, 29% of the population were against the EU when we joined, 
yes, but 71% voted in favour of going. Now, so in actual Hang on, fact... what did you say, 71%? What, what? Oh, 71, you mean for the original? The original no. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, but well, well. the country was split then. This <laughs> is not new. I didn't say it was. Every, all the part... No, no, I'm not saying you said that, but no. I'm just saying this is the sort of information which I know now, I heard from a, a, a comedy programme on Channel 4 recently, which I didn't know at the time of the referendum. And the refer during the referendum, there was an awful lot of opinion given on all sides, your programme in particular. Of course there was, that's what we exist to do. Far too little information, history or background. But, but with the best one in the world, of course there's a lot of in, uh, opinion expressed on that, of course, but, 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 but not by the presenters, I do assure, well, not in my case, um, and, and that's fine. But see, what I get a bit cross about is this idea that those people, and I speak as somebody who voted to remain, remember, uh, those people who um, voted to leave the European Union did not get the information that they needed or failed to understand the implications. Of, but by some miraculous process, those who voted to stay did. I don't follow that, you see, because I mean, what it seems to me to be saying, and, and although I voted to, to, uh, to, to, to remain, I have believed ever since the vote was announced in June, three years ago, uh, three and a half years ago, that uh, we had to leave. You cannot have a referendum, in my view, and then and tell the people before they vote that their vote will be acted upon. And then decide subsequently that actually no, 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 maybe, yes, true, there was a majority in favour of leaving, but actually no, we won't leave because an awful lot of those poor sods who didn't, who, who voted to leave didn't really know what they were doing, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll try and re-educate them. You can't do that in a democracy, it seems to me. Uh, well, any, any, moving on, Robert. Thank you, Robert Beveridge. Um, President Trump <laughs> um, claimed that uh, 50 to 60 percent of Germany's energy needs, For, so, uh, 50 to 60 percent of Germany's energy needs were being met by the new gas pipeline from Russia. Now, I heard that on the BBC and I heard it also repeated. However, I listened to the six o'clock news and there was a fact check later in the bulletin where the guy said, actually, it's 50 to 60% of Germany's gas needs and these are 20% of Germany's energy needs. But the problem as I see it is that many, many people are not news junkies like most of the people in this room and they don't listen to the fact checks later. All they get are the headlines and then the headlines are the ones that lead to, for example, the referendum result. And so f from my perspective, what the BBC ought to be doing is putting accuracy above impartiality in its guidelines. And then secondly, when somebody like President Trump lies, he needs to be called out. You can call it misinformation if you want a euphemism, but you've got to call out the lie at the point yeah, yeah. of the lie. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's fine if uh, A, you are 100% right, and you know for a fact that the president or whoever it happens to be was 100% wrong. That, that, that you, you, could, you could just about do that. But, and if it's a matter of fact, easy to check. Now, I do, what I do not believe you can do is I do an interview with a German a member of the Bundestag or whatever it happens to be, and, 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 and that person tells me something about Germany's energy policy um, and I may be uncertain of whether it's true or whatever. If I am uncertain, then I will voice my uncertainty. I'll say, but surely the reality is so-and-so, so-and-so. If I don't know, and the odds are, to be perfectly honest, I probably won't if it's, an asp you know, if it's something. You know, uh, where, where do you do that? Do you, having done this live interview in which Trump or whoever it happens to be has said something totally nonsensical, do you, at that point, have the newsreader 
let's say it's the 1800 News, or indeed the Today Programme, have the newsreader say, um, that was uh, President so-and-so speaking about so-and-so. Um, the BBC has since ascertained that what he was saying was complete bollocks. Now, I'm sorry, you can't do that. You can't do that. If it is a matter of, uh, uh, look, during, let's go back to a specific example of, uh, where, where in, 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 of something of which, where, where I personally was involved. You will remember, everybody in this room will remember that there was a bus used during the uh, referendum which had a certain slogan plastered over its side which told, um, which was a lie. It was simply not true. Now, that particular morning that the bus made its appearance, it so happened that I was interviewing somebody called Boris Johnson at 10 past eight. Now, that was such an egregious and obvious piece of misinformation, or a lie, if you prefer, that it took us 30 seconds to establish that it was nonsense, because he simply didn't, it, 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 as you know, it, it simply didn't take account of the rebate, and so on. It was nonsense. It's nonsense. And I put that point to uh, Boris Johnson when he appeared uh, at, at, at 10 past eight. He got around it, incidentally, by the simple expedient because he happened to be in, I think, Cornwall at the time and therefore not in the studio and therefore on one of these miraculous electronic, digital, whatever the hell it was. Like, he was able to pretend, which he did brilliantly, he does brilliantly, had done brilliantly, uh, not to be able to hear me properly. And, 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 and I got nowhere with him because at no point did he answer the question. Um, so what do you do in a case like that? Now, you report it in the 8 o'clock news bulletin. You report that Boris Johnson has said uh, 350 million per week go to the National Health Service. Blah, blah, blah. You can't then correct it. You can't do that. You simply can't do that. You, you can certainly do an interview with Laura Koonsberg or whoever it happens to be later to say, you know when Boris Johnson said that or this or the other, or, or, or Chris, our reality check correspondent, whatever. Incidentally, I'm uneasy about the notion of a reality check specialist, as it were, for reasons that I won't take too long to explain. But anyway, whatever. But you can't, you can't correct mistakes at the time because the BBC happens to think it was a mistake. We may be right. We might not be. Who knows? It's very difficult. Sorry. We are going to, look, we are going to broadcast the BBC and every other broadcasting and every other news organization in the world is going to broadcast an enormous amount of material that is simply wrong. That is the case. That is the nature of humanity. I mean, sometimes it will be deliberate, the result of deliberate lying. Sometimes it will be the case of stupidity. Sometimes it will be because there's insufficient information to whatever. But an awful lot. And in the end, it is down to us because I'm one of you now, as opposed to one of them, it is down to us, the listeners, the viewers, I hate the word, the consumers, the citizens, let's use the word citizens, to make our own judgment. And we do that, and the responsibility is on us, as well as on the broadcaster, to check as much as we possibly can. And if we make a big enough effort, we will be able to establish, with a bit of luck, something approximating to the truth. Or rather, I prefer to use the word facts, because there's no truth. Facts, facts. But I'm with you in principle. One more question from the floor. In the middle, lady in the middle at the back there. Thank you, Mr. Humphreys, for being here. I just had a chance to uh, hear about your first days in Wales and uh, look forward to reading your book. Um, so, what the Washington Post, and I'm sure some people right here know this, the Washington Post and the New York Times do, is to have some of the people you were talking about, the fact check specialists who stay up all night, and when he gets up and has his little Twitter break, uh, they immediately start doing the fact check and the background, and what does this have to do? Uh, because of the importance of what some of us feel is a threat to the democracy of not just the United States, but of a lot of the West. It seems to be mandatory. Uh, I hate to use a word that definite, but mandatory 
that we do those checks and correct those imbalances as soon as possible. No, I agree with that. But I, w I would just ask a question. How many people in this room um, believe everything Donald Trump says? <laughs> Gosh, not one. I wonder why that should be. that he lies, or they do believe what he says. That's the real problem. Well, but, you know, that's the way of the world, I'm afraid, and there's nothing we can do about that. <laughs> nothing we can do about that. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. I've actually got one final question, John, in this uh, long and uh, distinguished career. Is there anybody that you haven't interviewed that you would have liked to have interviewed? Oh, yes. The Queen. But, but the Queen. <laughs> the Queen. <laughs> Absolutely. You've got it in one. I want to sit there, wanted, to sit there and say, 10 past eight, and with me in the studio this morning, I'm managing it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And I did, I did think, I mean, just think how much she could tell you if she really wanted to, eh? You know? I mean, you know, we've got, no, she is unique in the world, isn't she? Nobody has had her exposure to so many powerful people, with so, all the rest of it. And then there's the gossip. And then there's Prince Andrew. I mean, you know, did, 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 any, did anyway. you ever get close? Uh, well, I, well, I'm glad you are. Yeah, I did. I thought I did. I thought I did. I, I had an invitation. Uh, there was a message left on my answer a few years ago um, to uh, uh, one of her private lunches at Buckingham Palace. And I thought, my goodness, woo -hoo, this may mean that she wants to, you know, establish her. Oh, wow. And obviously I went. Um, and uh, and it, uh, I do recall vividly on my being escorted through the palace by one of her courtiers, you know, it was rather elegant. And I was, I was slightly nervous, I have to say. And I said I didn't realise that people like me got invited to uh, uh, private lunches with the Queen. And, and, and he looked down at me and he said, no, sir, neither did I. <laughs> which, which was not the most encouraging thing that he could have said. But anyway, we got through a delightful lunch and all that. And finished the lunch. And, and she, when she has, as some of you will doubtless know, when she uh, has finished lunch, she likes to stand having coffee in a little ante room, I think, so she can feed bits of stuff to these awful dogs of hers. Anyway, she and I were standing, just the two of us standing together, chatting. And, and I did what you would expect. You know, I, I said, thank you very much, lovely lunch and all that. And since I'm here, I wonder whether you've ever considered you know, doing um, an interview with me. And she didn't hesitate. She looked up at me and she said, no. <laughs> and I waited. No more came. So I thought, well, it's an opening. You know, I will I try to explain. And I delivered the speech that I had prepared earlier because I sort of thought, you know, I might get that response. And I went into the whole thing about how the royal family had changed and blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. I thought I'd made a pretty convincing case for her to do some sort of, you know, yeah. and she <laughs> looked back up at me and she said, no, what, what, I quote verbatim, what small Mr. Humphreys, if one were ever going to do such a thing, it would most certainly not be with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an appropriate, uh, appropriate note to end on. Exactly. Thank, <laughs> thanks so much, Sean. We really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all very much. Copies of the book are still available outside. Oh. So do I. <laughs>